Hallo, vielen Dank und guten Abend auch von uns. Wir freuen uns, dass trotz des guten Wetters das Interesse an der inhaltlichen Veranstaltung doch gewonnen hat, wahrscheinlich bei vielen. Und wollen auch gleich in Medias Res gehen. Gitti hat uns schon eingeführt. Internationale Strafgerichtsbarkeit. Der Internationale Strafgerichtshof ist gerade dieser Tage zehn Jahre alt geworden. Es gab viel Kritik, es gab auch viel Lob der Fortschritte. Man muss, glaube ich, beides sehen und beides soll sich die Waage halten. Wir konzentrieren uns heute auf ein Thema, was bei dieser Würdigung eine wichtige Rolle spielt, nämlich der Umgang mit sexualisierter Gewalt. Wie kann das Schweigen gebrochen werden? Wie kann die Straflosigkeit gebrochen werden, die sexuelle Gewalt umgibt? Früher war das immer so ein Nebenprodukt von Krieg. Das fand halt statt und das wurde kaum, da wurde kaum jemand dafür zur Rechenschaft gezogen. Und jetzt ist mit dem Urteil gegen Charles Taylor, ein Staatschef, ein früherer Staatschef, von dem Sondergerichtshof in Sierra Leone zur Rechenschaft gezogen worden. Können wir daraus was lernen für andere Fälle, die jetzt anstehen? Was kann die Gesellschaft in Sierra Leone mit diesem Urteil anfangen? Ist es eine Genugtuung für die Opfer? Was fehlt noch? Wie können nationale Mechanismen und nationale Organisationen das Urteil nutzen? Das sind die Fragen, die wir hier jetzt vor allem diskutieren wollen. Ähm, wie haben wir uns das vorgestellt? Wir könnten hier... Wir haben das schon in der Vorbesprechung gemerkt. Ich glaube, wir könnten hier stundenlang bestreiten, die beiden Diskutanten und, und Podiumsteilnehmer. Wir haben uns aber gedacht, vielleicht fangen wir mit einem kurzen Input an und fangen dann auch wirklich gleich an zu diskutieren. Und sicherlich haben Sie und ihr auch ganz viele Fragen, die wir auf jeden Fall auch beantworten wollen und, und zur Weiterdiskussion nutzen wollen. Insofern kurze Statements hier und so, dass wir eigentlich in einer Dreiviertelstunde dann auch wirklich in die Diskussion kommen. Beginnen wollen wir mit, mit Tommy Ibrahim, äh, mit Ibrahim Tommy, Entschuldigung, <lacht> Ibrahim Tommy, ähm, Ibra, äh, Tommy, you, you're, jetzt, na, jetzt ist es schwierig, genau. Now I'm switching to English and I get this, okay. Ibrahim, you're, you're working uh, on the special court, you've been working in the special court, so you're the right person to really tell us what the court that has existed since 2002 has been able to do with regards to this specific trial, but also with regards to sexual violence in Sierra Leone. And uh, let me just briefly present you a bit more, because uh, you've been working since 2003 to 2007, I believe, in the uh, public information unit of the court, and then you moved to work with the US Embassy for a while, but now you're the executive director of this very interesting center Uh, Gitti mentioned it's on accountability and rule of law and you mentioned before that before it was really established as an organization, a civil society organization monitoring and accompanying what the court does and linking it to Sierra Leonean initiatives and, and mechanisms. So you're very well placed and we're very interested to hear what is this verdict against Charles Taylor? How did it come about and what, how can you use it for your work in, in the broader context? It's not just jurisprudence, it's also bringing justice, bringing a sense of reconciliation, bringing hopefully more peace to, to the society. And is it such a milestone and what's missing and what can you and others contribute? And then we'll follow up in what does this mean on the international level. So I, I ask you please to give, give us all the information and uh, we'll ask you more questions afterwards anyway. Absolutely. Thank you very much and uh, I'm pleased to be here. Many thanks to the um, Heinrich Boyle Foundation. Um, excuse my German. Uh, some pronunciations may be inaccurate, but I'm extremely pleased to be here. This is such a fantastic opportunity for me to share my perspective with you, and I think um, it promises a great evening, and I like it to be very interactive. Feel free to throw many questions at me. I may not be able to cover all the issues in the first 15 minutes, which has been allocated to me, but I'm happy to take questions from you um, during this session. Um, by way of background, my assumption is that um, most of us in the room 
have heard about the special code, but I'm just going to give a quick background to the code and talk about how everything evolved to um, what we had on the third of May with the sentencing um, judgment in the Chastelo trial. Um, the special code um, was established basically as a result of an agreement between the Syrian government and the United Nations. Um, it was set up to try those who bore the greatest responsibility for the atrocities that took place in Sierra Leone. Indeed, um, serious, egregious crimes took place in Sierra Leone, maiming, rape, amputation, forced marriage, unlawful killing, just about any crime that you can think of that is humanly possible took place during the conflict. And then in 2002, the United Nations and the Israeli government appointed an independent prosecutor. The prosecutor arrived in the country in 2002 and started investigations. And in 2003, the prosecution preferred charges against 13 persons. Of all the 13 persons, only nine were ultimately tried and convicted. And I should add that, unfortunately for the people of Sierra Leone, the key players in the conflict in Sierra Leone, the key Sierra Leonean players, the leader of the RUF group, the battlefield commander, um, you, um, sorry, the leader of the RUF group was for the Sankor, the battlefield commander, General Mosquito or Sambokari, Johnny Paul Kruma, who was the head of the Junta Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, they all died, including the head of the civil defense forces in Ghanaman. They all died before their trials began or concluded. So in the end, Chastillo was the highest profile inductee of the court. So it was critical that he was arrested, transferred into the custody of the court, and ultimately tried. So... Um, he was transferred into the custody of the court in 2006, but his trial actually did not begin until 2008. But I should also like to point out that he was not tried in Freetown, in Sierra Leone. He was tried in The Hague because the UN Security Council was concerned that his trial in Sierra Leone could have security implications for the region. But I should note straight away that it had serious implications in terms of victims' access to the court, to the proceedings. So it meant that victims who were interested in the proceedings needed to go to the courtroom because the court provided live video streaming. But I have to be very clear about this. It was not helpful because victims would have loved to see Taylor physically in the, in the courtroom. But that did not happen. However, the court tried to fill the, those gaps by making sure that not only provide live feeds, but they also did outreach programs. Now, um, Catherine spoke a bit about my organization. What we did and continue to do was to make sure that we provided we, a monthly analysis of the, all the proceedings before the special court, in particular the Taylor trial. So in addition to our newsletter, we also did media and community outreach programs, just basically providing updates on what was going on in the Taylor trial. Now, so I'd like to quickly link Taylor to Sierra Leone or how the prosecutor, because the question has been asked, why is it that Taylor was the um, president of Liberia? And there was war in Liberia too. Why is it that he was not tried for the alleged crimes that he perpetrated in Liberia, but he was instead tried for the crimes that took place in Sierra Leone? Now, the statute of the special court basically gave the prosecutor the mandate to indict anyone whom he had sort of sufficient or convincing evidence against. And the special court, one of the advantages of the special court was that it sat in the country where the crimes took place. So the trials, apart from the Taylor trial, took place in Sierra Leone, which meant that the prosecutor could go across the country just talking to victims, talking to ordinary Sierra Leoneans. Through his discussions with these people, I tell you, almost every village, every um, district the prosecutor went, the people would tell him, Chastelor was responsible for the conflict in Sierra Leone. Chastelor played a huge part. 
And that was basically what led him to Chas Taylor. So he had a job of establishing Taylor, uh, sorry, linking Taylor to the crimes that took place in Sierra Leone. So that was basically the major issue in the Taylor trial, linking Taylor to the RUF forces in Sierra Leone and the AFRC forces in Sierra Leone. Um, I'll talk to you about those forces later on, but I just would um, like you to keep those names in mind. RUF, Rebels of the Revolutionary United Front. Um, AFRC, the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council. CDF, Civil Defense Forces. Those were the, and of course, Jastelo, who I'm sure everyone knows about. So those are the key forces in the conflict in Sierra Leone. Now, so on the 26th April, there was a verdict in the Taylor trial nearly five years after the um, case started. And most importantly, he was convicted on all the 11 counts against him, including sexual slavery, sexual violence, rape, etc. Now, what are the implications of the Taylor trial and verdict for efforts at combating sexual and gender-based violence? I have made the point that just the jurisprudence of the special court is going to be very important in attempts at fostering um, accountability um, for gender and sexual-based crimes. First off, the Chastilla defense team made a very strong argument at the time that as a head of state, Chastilla should have never been tried, that he should have enjoyed what is called head of state impunity, uh, immunity. But the Apis Chamber ruled that head of state immunity does not apply at all to the prosecution of international crimes. And that ruling was critical. It was a milestone in terms of holding the most powerful people um, accountable for their crimes. Another ruling of the court, which is very critical, and in fact that was in the verdict, that sexual slavery and sexual violence now constitute acts of terrorizing the civilian population. It's also very important and it's going to be um, very helpful in terms of the jurisprudence of um, um, international criminal tribunals. And I also like to quote quickly what Kelly Askin. Kelly Askin works for the OSJI. She is the senior legal officer at, uh, at the OSJI. After the verdict, she wrote this. She said, there have not been many previous judgments in international war crimes tribunals in which the accused were found guilty of rape, sexual slavery, and other forms of sexual violence. But virtually all were when the accused physically perpetrated the rape or was present, encouraging, ordering, or ignoring the crimes. The tale of verdict represents a welcome and long overdue recognition that civilian or military leaders who are far from battlefield but who support and encourage sexual violence or make no attempt to prevent or punish it can be held responsible for sex crimes. So what does that mean? In essence, Chastillo did not have to be in Sierra Leone. He did not have to be on the ground. He did not have to be present when those crimes were taking place. The fact that he supported the rebels, he provided logistics, he provided communication sets, he provided money, he provided all the support the rebels needed. And those rebels were using his support to commit those crimes. Means now that El Bashir, for example, and the DRC, for example, those leaders do not have to be on the ground for them to be sort of tried and convicted, of course, where there's overwhelming evidence that they are responsible for sexual gender-based crimes. I think that is significant, and that is something we should all celebrate. And I think um, going forward, we should make um, we should constantly underline that fact. Something that we should also note about the um, jurisprudence of the court, and indeed this verdict, is the fact that it's not about public opinion, but I already made the point that the people of Sierra Leone, the victims of the conflict in Sierra Leone, the most affected victims of the conflict, women, children. And I like to point out that women suffer, there are different layers of suffering. So when we're talking about gender-specific crimes like rape, sexual slavery, sexual violence, we should keep in mind that women suffer all of these crimes. And on top of that, 
the other layers of crimes, like unlawful killing, you know, they also suffer. They also suffer through the suffering of their children. So if a, if a, 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 if a woman's daughter is abducted and raped in her presence, she's going to suffer psychologically. She's going to suffer emotionally. So there are various layers of suffering, and women went through all of those. So it is important that we're having discussions like this because it is not just a case of one crime or a set of crimes, it's about actually the different layers of suffering during conflict. And I thought I should point out um, the fact that women are usually um, the, the most affected um, victims of the conflict. But I'd like to raise a question. I think it's a very important question. As significant as the Taylor trial and verdict is, does anyone believe that it's going to necessarily bring an end to the commission of sexual-based crimes during conflict? Unfortunately, I don't think so. I mean, the trial and conviction of a single man, regardless of how powerful he was, and is, he still is, I'm sure, is not going to necessarily bring an end to the commission of sexual-based crimes during conflict. What I believe is that it is certainly an important verdict in the sense that we can use it for advocacy purposes. We can use it basically to show that no one can be shielded legally from facing justice if he or she is believed to have committed such crimes. But at the international level, I think the international community has to make deliberate efforts to make sure that accountability mechanisms are strengthened. They support the work of the ICC, for example, support the, the work of other international criminal tribunals that uh, want to foster accountability for sexual and gender-based crimes during conflict. But at the domestic level, too, it's not just during conflict or at the international level. At the domestic level, it's very important that um, to help victims to come to terms with the past, I think one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that the law enforcement and justice institutions at the national level are working, strengthening the accountability um, system, make sure that women who suffer during conflict and for a very long time had little or no hope that they would ever get justice, understand that now that the war is over, specifically in Sierra Leone, if they were to suffer any sexual or gender-based crimes, there will be a credible system to bring to justice those who are responsible for such crimes. In other words, if we do not have any credible local system of justice or local accountability mechanisms, it's going to make women continue to live in perpetual fear, and that is not going to help them overcome the um, abuses they suffered during a conflict. So strengthening account national accountability systems mean be, uh, means basically establishing witness and victim support services and also supporting the work of the police force and also making sure that the justice system works. I'm going to bring out a very quick statistic in my country, Sierra Leone. In 2011, last year, at least 600 complaints relating to sexual agenda-based violence we have filed with the police just in one region of the country. We have four regions. In just one, one district, in fact, 600 complaints. Of all those complaints, only 15 convictions. I mean, domestic violence, gender-based crimes, 600 complaints, only 15 convictions were reached. It shows how much work we've got to do at the national level. In other words, if we cannot, even after the war, foster accountability for sexual and gender-based crimes. As important as the Taylor verdict is, people are going to continue thinking that they are still in the war years, and we cannot let that happen. And that is why my organization works basically to foster accountability and make sure to ensure that rule of law works. It's also important to focus on the social needs of victims because they cannot... Um, realistically um, um, overcome the challenges that the, that the war um, posed if we do not address our social economic um, needs through an effective reparations program. And um, that is why I think we have a reparations program in Sierra Leone, but it's not very effective. A Victims Trust Fund was established in 2009, 
But as we speak, um, um, we have the reparations committee has received funds from the UN, and that's about it. So victims, victims need serious support. And um, so I'd like to talk quickly about why was it that the prosecutor in Sierra Leone was successful at investigating sexual and gender-based crimes, and why is it that in other jurisdictions there are maybe difficulties or there is sort of some hesitation that it is very difficult or almost impossible to do in other jurisdictions. First off, I think the statute of the court basically gives the prosecutor the mandate to follow where the evidence led him, so to speak. And if that was how he was able to um, get at just law and indeed the other um, convicts of the court. And um, the fact also that the trial took place in Australia meant that the prosecutor could use um, local um, investigation agencies, like even the police. So the local police force was very critical. But during the war, we also had international organizations, regional organizations like ECOWAS, like MSF. These organizations had basically collected a bunch of information, which I'm sure we are very useful to the court and the prosecutor in particular. There was also the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which had already gone ahead, basically obtaining statements and on, um, holding public hearings. The, those statements and even testimony at those um, hearings, we are very useful to the prosecutor. And um, yes, there was a very effective witness and victims protection services at the office of the OTP, which ensured that victims of free, victims of sexual crimes could basically um, share their um, experiences with the prosecutor um, sort of anonymously without anyone knowing that they indeed testify or spoke to the prosecutor. And in some cases, people were relocated from their villages, from towns, relocated to safe homes in Freetown just so they could testify um, without getting harassed. So those systems, those structures are very critical in terms of getting truth from um, um, victim survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. And um, um, let me just round up by saying that um, certainly this still of verdict. In Sierra Leone, um, we've had serious discussions about what the verdict means for victims. And I think the overwhelming view is that um, it certainly represents justice. It has given the victims a sense of relief. And um, going forward, one of the things that we'll be doing is to basically explain to the people of Sierra Leone what the verdict means. But like, like I've said, it's not going to be, the challenges are not going to be overcome overnight. More efforts are required at the national level, at the international level. But this is certainly a very powerful tool, a very powerful verdict that we can use. And I encourage everyone in the room to have a chance to look at the verdict. It's a really good verdict. And the judges made, did a good job of really giving us um, sort of just a summary. There's a 44 page summary. You can go through that. Instances, excerpts of witness testimony, just telling um, us how victims suffered during the war. So I think addressing the needs of victims making sure that the reparations program, while at the same time strengthening national accountability mechanisms at, at the national level, is going to be very, very important. I can't round up without talking about Liberia. And I'm sure during the um, question and answer session, I'll get some more time to talk about some other issues. But now, what does the Taylor trial or verdict mean for Liberia? Personally, I don't think it's going to undermine efforts at strengthening peace in that country. The peace consolidation um, efforts will um, go on, on uninterrupted. There will be no challenges, but I think it's going to pose some challenges in terms of um, reconciliation efforts. Remember, Chastela was, a, he, I mean, he had his own following. He was a leader, and through some patronage, he gave a lot of people money, jobs, and so he was and is still popular in Liberia. And it's going to have some political fallout. Maybe, obviously, not during um, Ellen Johnson Salif's time, but it's going to make the reconciliation effort a bit more difficult, especially so that the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Liberia 
have not been implemented. Remember that um, commission recommended, I think, 100, at least 140 people who should have been tried. But nobody's talking about that. It recommended at least 40 people who should have been barred from politics, including the president. And that is why those recommendations have not been implemented. So indeed, um, this is going to have serious implications for reconciliation efforts in Liberia, but I'm not sure it's going to um, affect the peace consolidation efforts. In Sierra Leone, yes, um, we will fly with the judgment. We think it represents justice. We think it represents the views of most Sierra Leoneans in terms of whom they thought was um, responsible for the vac um, um, the, the um, of crimes that they suffered. But um, during the Q&A session, I may have left a few points out, but during the Q&A session, please, um, throw all the questions at me. I'll be willing to respond to those questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Ibrahim, for you know tackling this task of bringing us to the context, bringing us to who Charles Taylor is and why he was tried, and also highlighting the factors that made it possible, and at the same time mentioning the challenges ahead, both for Sierra Leonean society, the international uh, community, and uh, Liberia on the side. So, so now we turn to the international side. So looking at this was a specific court, this was a hybrid court, one of the few ad hoc tribunals that deal with specific countries. You mentioned that it was done in, in uh, The Hague for security reasons, so no trial in, in Sierra Leone itself for, for Taylor, but very close in close proximity to the International Criminal Court. And uh, Katie worked for, for the Women's Initiative for Gender Justice, and similarly to, to Ibrahim's organization, you've come out of a caucus that rallied for gender justice at the at the Rome conference and, and around the statute, and you're closely monitoring what's happening, the cases that, that are being tried in the International Criminal Court, but also you do much more. You work with uh, Uganda and Egypt and, and other places uh, with civil society organizations uh, linking up to those justice mechanisms. So let me just ask you also... You've, Ibrahim has mentioned a couple of factors he has identified that were key in bringing sexual violence to the court and also getting a verdict on them and having a former head of state held accountable. He has not been physically present, but there has been a chain of command. He is responsible. So what will this do to other cases? And... Um, we know that the International Criminal Court for, for the normal public is painstakingly slow. It's treating painstakingly few people and few cases. So do you see that this is, will be an impulse and what and maybe what lessons can be learned? Are there like tips and tricks from Chief Prosecutor Brenda Hollis that can be applied? Can civil society organizations pick up some of the advocacy work that has been done in Sierra Leone? So and probably lots of other questions I can't ask specifically. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you, Barbara, for the introduction, and thank you, Ibrahim, for the wonderful um, overview of, of the issues of Charles Taylor, of the Special Court, and, and of its meaning and its impact in both Sierra Leone and Liberia. I think there's a lot more we can say about that. Um, uh, so thank you also to Gunda Werner for convening us to talk about this, because it's such an important moment in international justice um, as Barbara mentioned, the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice is an international women's human rights organization. We have uh, four offices, one in The Hague in the Netherlands. We also have two offices in Uganda and an office in Egypt. Um, we work with uh, women who are affected by the conflicts that are under investigation by the International Criminal Court. So currently we're working in Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Sudan, Libya, Kenya, and Cote d'Ivoire. Those are the seven situation countries before the ICC. Um, and we work on the legal side of things. We also work in peace processes. We have a extensive country-based programs and a network of over 6,000 grassroots women's rights and peace activists who are our partners in this work. So 
I am positioned, as Barbara was saying, to, um, because of our work on the ICC, make a couple of connections and suggestions as to how the Charles Taylor verdict may have an impact going forward for international justice, and also to look at the bigger picture um, that, that, you know, uh, of the work of the special court um, in relation to the ICC. Before we do that, or, or in doing that, I want to dive in a little bit to the verdict and to the... Um, the work of the Special Court on Sexual Violence, because that in itself is significant. Um, Ibrahim gave us an overview of what the court was, that it was founded, it began in 2002. It had a special mandate as a hybrid tribunal between the domestic system of Sierra Leone with international assistance to try international crimes um, arising out of the conflict in Sierra Leone. Now, I mention this because it... uh, tried four cases, and four very significant cases, but it actually sounds like a small number, and we heard that actually many of the people who were most responsible, could be considered most responsible for the conflict, were not available to be tried because they had, had passed away by the time uh, they, they could be tried. But these four cases um, are very significant, and um, in fact, the prosecutor of the special court made the prosecution of gender-based crimes a priority, and that's one of the lessons learned that we can talk about further. Um, As a result, 10 of the 13 accused at the special court were charged with rape and sexual slavery as a crime against humanity and outrages upon personal dignity as a war crime. And then six of the accused were also charged with forced marriage as a crime against humanity under the heading of other inhumane acts. And that brings us to one of the big developments in international law, uh, the jurisprudence on forced marriage, which came out of the AFRC and RUF cases. And in that case, um, <clears throat> the, the, in the appeals judgment, it was the first time at an international level that anyone had been held individually liable for the crime by an international criminal tribunal. And this came about um, in a bit of a convoluted way in the dissenting opinion of one of the judges on the trial chamber who disagreed that the majority of the judges said that forced marriage, the charge of forced marriage, was duplicating the charge of sexual slavery. And one of the things that's happened in the development of how we're looking at international, uh, at gender-based crimes and international criminal law is a proliferation of the different crimes and the different ways that we can talk about gender-based crimes and international criminal law. So actually, we want the specificity of a crime of forced marriage and a crime of sexual slavery. We want very detailed elements of crimes that will describe accurately the uh, experience of sexual violence and conflict. So in the end, the appeals chamber agreed with the dissenting judge that other factors and other elements of the crime of forced marriage merited it being considered a separate crime and and a separate crime conviction um, in addition to sexual slavery. So that's one big development. And this is one of the four cases, or two of the four cases, rather, um, at the special court. Then the CDF case, which was the case of the government troops, the, the government leaders, Um, is another example, a very important example from the special court, where because of errors on the part of the prosecution in how they tried to bring the charges of sexual violence at a late stage of the proceedings prior to the start of trial, the judges found that actually those charges could not be brought. And so despite the fact that, that it was clear that sexual violence had been committed and witnesses were prepared to testify about that element of their experience, they were not allowed to testify about the sexual violence that they experienced because, and reasonably, the accused is not being charged with those crimes. And so in order to have a fair trial of the accused, um, they would not want to hear testimony about charges that were not brought. It was the burden on the prosecution to bring those charges in the correct time. There's a lot of discussion that we can have about the choices a prosecutor makes and the challenges of finding the witnesses to substantiate crimes and live witness testimony versus other types of evidence in terms of of supporting these crimes and convictions for these crimes. 
But when people think of the special court and up to the Taylor judgment, I would say that those were the sort of banner achievements or non-achievements in relation to prosecution of gender crimes. So moving on to the Taylor case, um, as Ibrahim mentioned, he was convicted of aiding and abetting. And that was not the only um, mode of liability that the prosecution was seeking. They um, did not find that he was a participant in what is called a joint criminal enterprise, nor did they find that he ordered, instigated, or committed the crimes. So they found that he provided support to allow the rebel groups to commit these crimes of sexual violence. And this is highly significant that at the level of a former head of state, the former president of Liberia, that level of responsibility for rape, sexual slavery, outrages, and uh, terrorizing the civilian population is is highly significant. Um, I just want to to go over... um, they, they made some findings on forced marriage that were quite interesting. Um, they attempted to go further with clarifying the distinction between forced marriage and sexual slavery. And in the judgment, and just to mention, when Ibrahim suggests that we all read it, it's 2,500 pages long. <laughs> so a record in actually international criminal institutions and um, a very valuable historical document for that because it... Uh, goes into great detail about the experience of the victim survivors of rape and other forms of sexual violence in the conflict. Um, But they, in fact, resisted using the phrase forced marriage, and they preferred to call it conjugal slavery because they saw that that satisfied all of the elements of the existing definition of sexual slavery, but also the additional component of forced conjugal labor. So what's happening in the law is an examination of how do we accurately characterize legally what happens to women in a conflict like this when they are abducted, when they are forced to serve in a number of capacities with an armed group. Um, And and so that's just to bookmark that because it's it's quite a... We could have a very detailed discussion about it, but it's, it's a developing area of the law and actually the Taylor jurisprudence now provides another piece of that that we'll have to consider and that legal scholars will have a great time debating for many years. Um, another noteworthy finding that you already mentioned is the, the crime of terrorizing the civilian population. And that is really significant because, um, and just to be clear, it's distinct from terrorism. It's, it's a d- different crime. Um, but what they held was that rape, sexual slavery, forced marriages, and outrages, when committed, committed against the civilian population with a specific intent to terrorize, amount to an act of terror. Now, if you are familiar with the nature of the crimes that were committed, the amputations, the carving of, of letters on people's chests so that they would be, or their heads, they would be marked as, as affiliated with one group or another, um, mutilations, horrible mutilations of women, of pregnant women, uh, you know, rape, uh, penetration with foreign objects. All of these things are described in the judgment. They all came out in the trial. <clears throat> um, the purposeful use of those brutal acts of sexual violence was captured in the conviction for this crime. And that, that is a highly significant development it really speaks to how rape is used as a weapon of war. And I think that's become a well-known phrase, but it's actually not just rape that is used as a weapon of war. It's violence against women generally, and in fact also violence against men. And at the ICC, there are a couple of significant cases where violence against men have have been charged. So that was what I wanted to highlight about the judgment itself. Um, Just to say a couple of things that come to mind about the International Criminal Court and and how this crosses over. Of course, the International Criminal Court is a permanent international criminal institution. It is separate from the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and therefore this is not a binding legal precedent on it in in a legal sense. Um, However, they can look to it as they look to the jurisprudence also of the Rwanda and Yugoslavia tribunals for examples of how they can interpret the law. And as was already mentioned, um, the importance of the statute. So the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court has the most advanced gender provisions 
of any international criminal institution that has existed to date. Um, it has, in terms of the substantive crimes that can be charged, rape and, and sexual slavery and forced pregnancy, and, and there, there's a, a, quite a long list, um, explicitly within the jurisdiction of the court. And that's quite different from Yugoslavia and Rwanda, where they had rape to work with, and they had to read other crimes into it, um, into a more limited statute. Um, so that already is a signal to the prosecution at the ICC that these are the crimes they should be seeking to prosecute. Um, this is the purpose of this court, the Rome Statute, the treaty that has now been signed by 122, 221 sorry, states is, is the, uh, the foundational document and the direction for the court. Um, other things to note that these, these are just advances is the, the procedural um, <clears throat> law that applies to the uh, testimony of victim survivors of sexual violence, that special measures are actually mandated by the Rome Statute and the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. And I can tell you more if we have time about how those have actually played out in the courtroom. Um, So to make the leap from the special court to the ICC, we have to realize that we have a different institution. We have a permanent institution with a broader and more detailed statute um, and with a much broader ge- geographical jurisdiction, certainly. Um, any state's party of the 121 state's parties, uh, situations can also be referred to this, uh, the court by the Security Council, as in the case of Darfur and Libya. Um, and the prosecutor can also open investigations on his own motion. So much broader jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the the permanence of it, I think, that, that it will try more than four cases. So it has a bit more time to get it right, but the expectations are very, very high. Um, there are some, some examples, I think, already in the ICC's limited jurisprudence. It has one conviction that just came out this year also of Thomas Lubanga from DRC for the crime of enlistment conscription and use of child soldiers, and it has two other trials that are currently concluding or underway and then uh, an additional, um, I guess they would be four trials, but they're multi-accused trials waiting to start. Um, <clears throat> so it, it has a small number of cases before it as well, but there's a, already patterns and practices developing. Um, one of the things that has turned out to be very important, and I mentioned this at the beginning, is making a purposeful gender strategy to investigate and prosecute gender crimes. And it, if you look at how the ICC has developed to date, you can see that that has not always been in place. We have a new prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, who took office last month. She has made a very public commitment to prosecuting gender crimes um, and also significantly to working with local women's rights actors to um, in her investigations and in the, the work of the court. Um, so it, it already is starting on a slightly different foot. But I think that's one of the things that we look at. The other is um, the importance of witness testimony. I mentioned the example of the CDF case, also in the Taylor, uh, where, where there was no testimony of sexual violence. But in the Taylor case, there was quite significant testimony of victim survivors directly. Um, At the ICC, that is already happening in the two cases that have gone to trial where crimes of sexual violence have been charged, and that has proven to be uh, very significant in uh, hearing these experiences directly from the victim survivors to substantiate the charges. So that's already a development, and I think another lesson learned. In terms of the interpretation of the law, it has been uneven, And I think there have been some steps back by the ICC uh, in a number of the early decisions. In some cases, similar to what happened at the special court, um, the judges have decided that charges could be collapsed, essentially, that you don't need both rape and rape as torture. Uh, For example, in the case of Jean-Pierre Bembagombo, who is a Congolese military leader and politician who was tried for crimes committed by his armed forces in the Central African Republic. And we, as an organization, filed an amicus curiae brief contesting that reasoning. 
um, because, of course, the statute contains both the charges of rape and rape as torture, and the prosecutor submitted, we thought, sufficient evidence to support both charges. So there was, again, you know, a move by the judges to try to reduce and simplify what actually are complex um, uh, complex crimes. Um, those are a couple of the connections that, so in, investigations, the role of the judges and the interpretation of the law, um, the, the role of the prosecutor and the course that she sets for the institution are all very, very important things to look at. Thank you very much, Kate, also for a very dense uh, insight into this. And I think we've been able to, to hear a couple of, of important factors that came together and that we've also heard from you. There's lessons learned from cases that have not had the same strategy or a different strategy or a different take on mechanisms, how to present victims' testimonies, for example. Or, And what strikes me most is really the fact that having a clear strategy... Oh. Having a clear strategy and making this a priority, that seems to be something key. And I forgot to mention that your organization and you yourself are very active publishing a real important uh, insight on the International Criminal Court on the different aspects of how is gender taken into account. And you also really count the heads of, of the judges and of the prosecutors and of other staff. And it seems to make a difference after all. So, but we can probably uh, tackle this a bit further. And um, let me just ask you, both of you, one question briefly before we open this up. Do you think this is really preventing, in the sense of impunity is not granted anymore? Um, I think Margaret Wallström, the, the special rapporteur on, on sexual violence and conflicts, who will be succeeded by a Sierra Leonean national uh, this month, she has said, um, this breaks the silence and this is also um, a message to potential perpetrators. This is not going to be tolerated anymore. You're going to be held accountable. You mentioned this also. So how do you think uh, the people committing those atrocious crimes, you've, you've mentioned a couple of them, is, is that an ear they have on, on the International Criminal Court or is this just, you know, another factor? You want to start? I, I, can, I can say a couple of things um, about the International Criminal Court and, and the possible preventative role it may have had, but I also want to acknowledge that it's, it's quite complex. And in some cases, um, it seems to... The fear of prosecution can create uh, its own problems, so um, which is not at all a justification for not prosecuting leaders for international crimes. But, for example, uh, Omar Hassan al-Bashir, who is the president, the sitting president of Sudan, is uh, has an ICC arrest warrant outstanding against him. He has four ICC. Um, he has not stopped committing crimes through his troops in Darfur or the widespread oppression and human rights abuses that take place generally in Sudan. So um, on that level, it has not had uh, an effect of stopping the crimes being committed. However, um, his ability to move freely within Africa has been severely restricted when ICC member states uphold their obligations as signatories of this treaty to arrest him should he set foot in their country. So Uganda, Kenya, Chad, Malawi all have an obligation to arrest him should he set foot there. Now, some of the countries have not um, upheld this obligation. So he went to Kenya an ICC state party for the signing of the new constitution and was received and not arrested. Uh, he was invited to Uganda and did not go at the last minute. He went to Chad with no arrest. Um, but they have had to move the uh, location of the African Union Summit, which was to take place this week in Malawi. Is that right? Correct. Because Malawi announced that they would actually arrest him should he come. And so there's a big push-pull 
within the African Union and the ICC and states parties who are also in the African Union um, hammering out sort of political agreements about where events can be held that al-Bashir can attend and what their obligations are. So that's one example. Um, Just to mention a couple of examples from DRC, so the court's active cases, the ICC's active cases right now are are in the Congo and Central African Republic, but of of a Congolese national Um, In the Lubanga case, I have heard from researchers in Eastern DRC that there was what they called a Lubanga effect, which was an increased understanding and knowledge that enlistment and conscription of children under the age of 15 was a crime. Now, whether this results in them not doing it or whether this results in them sending them all into the bush when someone shows up who might report on it is an open question. So it can have both sides, I think, can, can happen. Also, Bosco Ataganda, who is a militia leader in eastern DRC and who was implicated in a number of serious attacks and in a lot of the conflict that is going on in the Kivu's region of eastern DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, after Lubanga's conviction, it appeared that the DRC government, who which had heretofore been protecting him, Um, by incorporating him into the National Army, was making moves to arrest him, um, either for a national trial or to give him to the ICC. And there was a splintering of the armed groups in eastern DRC and an increase in attacks, an increase in conflict, and now he is really on the run as opposed to uh, being someone who is safely or stably incorporated into the regular Congolese army. So that is something, we have a lot of partners and we do a lot of work in that region and we've been hearing a lot about the splintering of the militia groups, the formation of a new militia group and um, and, uh, very serious attacks, especially on women and girls um, and a lot of internal displacement in the region. So when it eventually results in an arrest, it will be a very important trial and Charges have been added to his um, his arrest warrant by the ICC, and there is a commitment on the part of the DRC government now to arrest him. Um, but we also note that these people are in positions that when they move to avoid the arrest, it can it can certainly make waves that have implications on, on human security. Yeah, uh, certainly. In my country, I'll give you a number of instances. In 2007, we had general elections, and as you probably know, elections are very mostly violent in Africa. Clearly, um, we could have had a country that could have easily, um, you know, slid back to conflict, but people kept referencing the work of the special court, especially after the indictment and transferring to the custody of the court, um, chastity law. So everyone, chastity law was on the lips of everyone in the sense that there was some realization that, yes, the international criminal um, justice system would come after anyone who deliberately, you know, started or instigated violence. So that played a part. And even going forward, I can tell you that the president in Sierra Leone has made reference to the chastity law verdict, has made reference to the ICC. He has publicly said that he's going to invite the ICC to send um, people to observe our elections, which, by the way, um, are in November. So, yes, leaders realize that their political power is not going to cheat them from prosecution anymore. This is critical. So I'm talking about two instances. In 2007, we could have easily had some serious incidents of violence in our country. But for the work of the special court, it did not happen. In 2012, the president of my country keeps referring to the work of the ICC. Remember what happened in Kenya? Yes. So clearly, international criminal justice, and indeed the trial and conviction of justice law, is one that has serious preventative implications. And we cannot... There are no two ways about it. But there's something that we should constantly think about, which is that, you know, the mid-level and junior commanders of fighters are not being brought to justice. 
So let's face it, Charles Taylor could have given support to the RUF and Air Force, but he was not really the one who was committing rape. The rapists are still in the community. The women see them moving around. What is happening? And when we have a government, my country um, signed the peace accord in 1996 and basically granted amnesty to all the fighters. That can be certainly a stumbling block to prosecutions. So going forward, even though it is important to sign peace accord, of course everyone wants peace, but we have to be careful about how much we can, you know, give in terms of um, basically granting amnesty to um, fighters. And that is going to be very difficult in terms of urging the Israeli government to bring to justice those mid-level commanders or even those um, who are in the rank and file of those fighting forces. But um, clearly, yes, um, the international criminal justice system, the special court for Australia in the ICC, I think these institutions are basically helping um, to um, prevent. And I think the challenge is about really bringing everyone to justice. It's quite a challenge, but I think that's something we should constantly um, discuss. Thank you for this, and I'm sure you have much more questions and comments. Can I ask you um, to briefly state your name? We'll pass around the microphone because we have translation, so please speak into the microphone and say your name briefly, and uh, I would suggest we collect one, two, th well, four, four or five comments and questions and then have a round on the panel and then go for another round. Would that be okay? And I don't know who's the microphone holder. Oh, you can also use this microphone, whatever. Mm -hmm. Where? Yeah. Das kann man benutzen, aber wer möchte, kann auch ein anderes haben. Also jetzt wäre Raum für weitere Fragen zur Vertiefung der Aspekte, die genannt wurden, aber auch für Kommentare und äh, Aspekte, die wir vielleicht noch nicht ausreichend beleuchtet haben. Ja, oh, Entschuldigung. This one. Yeah, I would have several questions. I um, have interviewed... Name oh, my name, Jonas Ecke. I've interviewed quite a few of Liberian refugees in Ghana, and for them, it seems like the most meaningful form of reconciliation was faith-based. So um, they have referred to a lot of warlords, and I later on researched it, that have gone through Pentecostal conversions, and then they have asked for forgiveness. And in many instances, the victims have actually granted forgiveness, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Liberia has, um, has said that that's okay, that's a legitimate way of, of dealing with crimes against humanity. That, are, that were very atrocious. And so my question would be whether there has been something similar in Sierra Leone too, and maybe if that is something that poses a, a problem for international law. And then also, as to international law, I would have the question, um, oftentimes when you talk about international law to people, they say, oh, it's quite, you know, there, it's a hypocrisy when it comes to Western policies that... Henry Kissinger, you know, would never be indicted, and there would be a lot of reasons for doing so, and, you know, from his policies, a lot of women suffered too. So what, what is your opinion about this in Sierra Leone or on the international level uh, about bringing Western leaders to justice at some point too? These will be my two questions. Vielen Dank. Gibt es noch weitere Fragen, die daran anschließen, bevor wir uns denen widmen? Ich frage auf Deutsch. <lacht> ich möchte auch Bezug nehmen auf das, was gerade gesagt wurde. Die Wahrheits- und Versöhnungskommission in Sierra Leone hat ja Empfehlungen gegeben, wie die Gesellschaft im Nachkriegs Sierra Leone gestaltet werden sollte. Sie haben erwähnt, dass die Empfehlungen für die Wahrheits- und Versöhnungskommission in Liberia nicht umgesetzt worden sind. Es gibt ja Stimmen aus Sierra Leone, die das auch für Sierra Leone behaupten. Die sagen auch, dort sind die Empfehlungen nicht umgesetzt. 
Inwieweit beeinflusst das die Themen, die Sie hier heute Abend diskutiert haben, also Strafgerichtsbarkeit? Ähm, weil diese Gleichzeitigkeit oder nahezu Gleichzeitigkeit von Weiz- und Versöhnungskommissionen und ähm, Strafprozessen ähm, ist ja auch eine ähm, trickreiche oder sehr kontroverse Angelegenheit. Ähm, das ist meine erste Frage. Meine zweite Frage geht zum Begriff der ähm, sexualisierten Gewalt. Ähm, Sie hatten erwähnt, dass ähm, äh, die Gewalt gegen die Frauen und Mädchen ähm, sekundäre Effekte hat, ähm, weil ja die ganze Gesellschaft eigentlich betroffen ist und ähm, die Gesellschaft terrorisiert werden sollte ähm, als ähm, Kriegsstrategie. Inwieweit ähm, ähm, strebt auch Ihre Organisation an, Männer als quasi sekundäre Opfer äh, zu integrieren und anzusprechen und auch Männer als ähm, äh, direkte Opfer ähm, zu gewinnen, um Aussagen zu machen, um auch diese Ausmaße der Gewalt in ähm, der Größe zu erfassen, weil häufig haben wir ja nur ähm, vage Vermutungen, wie viele Männer oder Jungen eigentlich Opfer sind. Und wenn wir das Beispiel Sierra Leone, gibt es ja auch sehr viele Augenzeugenberichte, dass Jungen gezwungen wurden, an ihren eigenen Verwandten, an den Omas, an den Müttern, an den Tanten Gewalt auszuüben, sexualisierte Gewalt auszuüben und dann in diese ähm, Kindersoldaten, Guerillagruppen einbezogen worden sind, ähm, inwieweit ist das auch Ihr Ziel, ähm, als Frauenorganisation solche Muster aufzugreifen, ähm, in das Strafrecht mit einzubeziehen? Ähm, welche Grundlage gibt das Romstatut dazu? Ja, vielen Dank. Das gibt uns, glaube ich, genug Stoff für, für eine Runde. Ich würde vorschlagen, wir fangen mit der Frage nach den Wahrheits- und Versöhnungskommissionen und sozusagen Aussöhnungsmechanismen, an die, weiß ich nicht, kirchlich äh, Glaubens, äh, auf glaubensbasierter äh, Basis entstanden sind in Liberia, in Sierra Leone und wie geht man da mit in der internationalen Strafgerichtsbarkeit damit um? Vielleicht fängt Kate kurz an und dann Ibrahim. Um, so, I, I won't speak to the the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Sierra Leone, because I think you'll, you'll get that very well. I mean, only to note that, that it, it is significant in, in the approach it took to sexual violence and to taking the testimonies and, and dedicating time and space to it. Um, what you're talking about uh, uh, in terms of faith-based reconciliation, I think an analogous or broader idea might be the idea of traditional justice mechanisms. So mechanisms of, of reconciliation and justice that are derived from the, the culture of the societies in conflict. Um, and I just want to mention an example uh, from Uganda where we work extensively and, and have um, a large network of, of partners in the greater north of Uganda, which was affected by the, the Lord's Resistance Army in the 20-plus-year 20 20 year conflict. Um, and There was a peace agreement that was partially negotiated. Um, the final peace agreement wasn't signed, but the, a number of agreements were negotiated with the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda in the Juba peace talks. And we did a lot of work with the women of the greater north in terms of what would be uh, in those talks and having them represented in the peace talks. And one of the things that came out of the Juba peace process was an agreement on accountability and reconciliation, which explicitly identifies among the range of, of transitional justice mechanisms that would be used um, in Uganda, traditional justice. Now, one of the issues that comes out of, so, so it is, it is on the table along with reparations, a truth commission, um, <clears throat> and prosecutions as a legitimate form of, of post-conflict, um, you know, a legitimate transitional justice mechanism. Um, there are a couple of issues that we would look at with that and, and that our, our partners have raised. Um, one is that there are a number of different ethnic groups with a number of different mechanisms that they would bring to, um, that, that would, would fall under traditional justice. and. They all have very specific uses, and they, in many cases, apply to contexts that are slightly different from the nature of the conflict that is uh, with the Lord's Resistance Army. But they have similar ideas of trying to reintegrate people who have done wrong into a tight community. So people who have committed crimes back into the community, 
what are the symbolic acts, what is the community involvement that will allow that to happen. Um, and some of these mechanisms you may be familiar with, like the Acholi uh, tradition of Mato Oput, which is drinking the bitter root, I think is, is the translation. And um, there are others. Um, there are some things that our partners identify that would have to change to make these mechanisms gender sensitive and to make them inclusive and in addressing all of the different types of crimes that have been committed in the conflict. And as you mentioned, there are impunity gaps where there are you know, prosecutions at the top and then there are different mechanisms and different um, types of, of you know, post-conflict prosecutions, whether they're domestic prosecutions or truth commissions um, or traditional mechanisms that, that would be appropriate to address all of the different uh, actors in a conflict. So I think it, in, in the practice of international law, it's certainly legitimate. It's present in formal agreements at an international level. You can also look at Gachacha in um, Uganda, which is a very widespread and established practice of, of upscaling a traditional reconciliation mechanism to address um, the enormous multitude of perpetrators of, of that uh, genocide. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's a problem necessarily. Um, I think that, that, that it can be used. I just think we would want to look at what the mechanisms are and what the impact, how they can be adapted to really address the, the conflict situation because many times they were, uh, the, the tradition comes out of a different level and s sort of scale of, of criminality. Would you like to pick up on that? Because also with the concrete uh, questions on Sierra Leone and Liberia and maybe also directly linking it to the recommendations that were made and partly taken up and partly not. Um, yeah, I, um, religion plays a critical role in the lives of many Sierra Leoneans. I think um, almost every Sierra Leone believes in one religion or the other, either Muslim or Christian. And the head of the TRC in Sierra Leone was the president of the Interreligious Council at the time. So certainly um, religion was a factor, even as the TRC was established and the leadership was determined. However, um, we have not um, taken any sort of deliberate measure to bring in religion on reconciliation efforts. What I know, though, is that after the TRC concluded its work and um, um, issued this report, there has been a follow-up initiative, which is called FAMBU Talk. It is run by an independent organization and is funded by a US-based organization. This initiative basically focuses on community healing. Fambu talk is a queer expression meaning family discussion. So what this organization has done across the country is to organize evening sessions, meetings, over some um, fire or some, because it basically fits into the sort of the culture, the tradition of, of the country. We have people at the end of the day in the villages who sit around fire and discuss and resolve their sort of community problems. So this has been the follow-up initiative. But even in Liberia, I think they have a follow-up TRC because they realized that the TRC had some issues, in fact, a lot of issues, to the extent that the recommendations have not been implemented at all. So there's going to be follow-up TRC in Liberia as well. I don't know whether it's the faith-based um, healing or reconciliation is going to be part of that. But we certainly ha have not um, um, taken that path. What I should say, though, is that um, to the question about whether the, the recommendations of the TRC have not been implemented in Sierra Leone, clearly... Um, Many of the recommendations of the TRC 
have been implemented. For example, we have a National Human Rights Commission. Okay, you can make a point about the effectiveness of those um, institutions that have been established as a result of the recommendations of the TRC. Um, the, we have a National Human Rights Commission in terms of access to justice. More courts have been established. Um, youth and employment is something that they are dealing with. We have gender laws because, indeed, the TRC report made serious um, findings and recommendations about how women were excluded. And so in Sierra Leone, currently, um, a bill is in the works that seeks to um, sort of increase um, female representation in all decision-making processes by 30%. In other words, it's called the M30 bill, minimum 30%, because the argument is that women need to be involved. And I spoke at an event a month ago where I said that our first scene as a country was that we had excluded the group that constitutes the majority. Women constitute, I think, 51%, 51.2% of the population in my country. Meanwhile, in the parliament, we have only, I think, about 13 or so percent representation of women. So efforts have been made to basically respond to those recommendations of the TRC. I mean, nothing is perfect, but I think we are um, light years ahead of the Liberian TRC. Um, yes, bringing Western leaders to justice. Um, you know, my organization um, believes that um, we need to sort of um, bring to justice everyone who is deemed to have committed crime. And one of the I've been accused oftentimes by my um, compatriots that, you know, we, I'm just one of those folks who basically protect Western leaders. And the ICC is just out there to, you know, um, in, is basically going after African leaders, what's happening to Western leaders. And it's a serious argument. I get the point that certainly we need to make sure that the powerful Western states are not shielding those who may be possible, if you like, possible candidates for international, um, for trial at international criminal tribunals. It's a legitimate concern, and even in Sierra Leone, there's a point that um, it's, it's a difficult argument to challenge that um, we are not doing enough to make sure that everyone who is, at least there, if there's a prima facie evidence that somebody needs to be brought before justice or to have his day in court, that person should, regardless of their nationality, their economic or political power. It's happening with the TR ICC. It's happening on the African continent. But I think most Africans are, be are getting even more disillusioned that it's just Africans. What's happening to other leaders? I mean, clearly, we cannot. Um, there should be no excuses. In Syria, it's not only about Western leaders. It's basically across the, the globe. It's across the world. It's not just about we Western leaders. And um, yes, I, I don't know whether I left any question out, but yeah, those are my recollections of the questions that you ask. Yeah, thank you very much. Kate, would you like to come in on this bias and the fact that only African uh, leaders and warlords have been tried so far. S -s sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting. I, I should also point out that, um, again, it is not an argument that has gone without response from us. And my position is that this complaint about how the ICC in particular has been going after only African leaders, my response has been, and the point is that it is not African leaders who should be complaining. It is actually the victims in Syria, the victims in Palestine, the victims in Gaza. We should be complaining, yes, but let's complain that there are victims in those countries who deserve justice and they are not getting justice. So if we can make an argument about that, fine. But to make an argument about how it is only African leaders, give me one instance where an African leader has been wrongly indicted or the indictment has been vexatious or malicious. None. So, again, we are basically responding, but I think the point has to be made that victims in that part of the world deserve justice, just as Africans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't think I can say that better, actually. Um, I mean, just, just to, to acknowledge the dynamic, and, and actually it is a very serious problem. It's a serious image problem for the court, and it's a serious practical problem, for example, that one of the referral mechanisms, the Security Council referral of Syria, appears to be being held up by Russia or the United States or China, in, you know, as the case may be. 
Um, so, so I think we have to acknowledge that because this court does function at, at political levels as a treaty-based court, um, in some of its uh, in some of its conception, then its ability to prosecute also has to contend with those political realities. But it is a permanent court, and there is no statute of limitations on these crimes. So should someone fall out of favor, become vulnerable to prosecution, the court maintains that jurisdiction, should all the other jurisdictional requirements be satisfied. And actually, I've read some very interesting um, discussions about how Kissinger should be prosecuted for war crimes that committed in Cambodia. And, you know, I mean, other... Other, um, it, it's really been hashed out quite a bit, and I think the law is there. Um, it, it just, this field of law has actually evolved very quickly um, since Nuremberg and since, um, you know, the middle of the century, really. There, it's really gathered speed in the 90s and with the jurisprudence of these institutions. And so we are at an early stage, I think, of the development of this area of the law and of accountability for, for top political leaders. Um, I wanted to answer your question about, about what we do and how we see the secondary effects um, on uh, victim survivors, specifically men and boys, and, and of the overall society, um, the, the, the impact on a society of how rape and sexual violence are used. And I... Just, um, I mean, of course, that, that is also part of our work. And I think it's uh, quite common that when we start talking about gender-based crimes, we don't look at it holistically or, you know, also the impact on men and boys. But at the ICC, and um, as I said, charges for, for crimes of sexual violence against men and boys have already been brought in the Bemba case for the rape of men, specifically men of uh, positions of power in the community, publicly and in front of their families and, and in front of their communities in order to humiliate them as part of the campaign um, of Bemba's troops against uh, people who are perceived to be supporting the, in, in, um, <clears throat> the political challenger of, of, in that in that situation. Um, also in Kenya around the violence, uh, the, the post-election violence, um, there was forced circumcision of men um, which had an ethnic dimension and, and of course a gender dimension and that is a crime that has been charged at the ICC. Now the judges have reinterpreted, it was charged as um, a other forms of sexual violence, forced circumcision was, and they interpreted, they, they changed the prosecution's characterization of the crime, the judges, um, before the, the case was sent to trial, to say that this is an other inhumane act. They said it's not a form of sexual violence, it's an inhumane act. And we think that interpretation is a step back because it doesn't acknowledge the purpose of that act. Um, we talked about in the Taylor judgment that how the, the description of the crime of terrorizing the civilian population acknowledges why and how sexual violence is used in a conflict. So definitely that's something we pay a lot of attention to. Um, another example, I mentioned earlier the distinction between charging rape and rape as torture. So the act of rape and then also the humiliation um, and the pain and suffering severe pain and suffering that, that is under the charge of torture, that f you lose an element of what's happening. Also in the Bemba case in the Central African Republic, men were forced to watch their family members be raped. So when a family member was not himself raped and there is the charge of rape as torture, he is included in the case because that severe pain and suffering is captured when the charges of rape and torture of, of rape as torture are taken out, then we lose that element of it, and that unfortunately is what happened in the Bemba case. So when the judges made that decision and our legal filing, they, they decided not to review that decision, which is a power they have. Um, that it would only go to trial on charges of rape. What we then started to advocate for with the prosecution and to really monitor was our 
victim survivors who are testifying in the courtroom being allowed to testify fully about the entirety of their experience so that they can describe the severe pain and suffering that they felt and that they continue to feel. And um, that becomes a part of the record, and it also opens up the possibility of further description, possibly charges being added back in, or possibly it being dealt with in sentencing or reparations. Um, One of the things we found in that case, which hasn't been the case in all uh, testimonies at the ICC, is that the defense and the judges and sometimes the prosecution were cutting the testimonies off a little bit um, in the courtroom, and so they were not being allowed to fully, they were saying, okay, we agree that the act of rape, we agree to that, the defense would say, so let's move on. Whereas what could happen and what has happened in other cases is that the victim survivor is allowed to fully testify in a narrative form about that experience and about all of the impacts and the, the, uh, the totality of the experience. Um, and that, I think, is a, a function that we, we want in the courtroom. And that certainly the Rome Statute is designed to enable um, that type of testimony You know, there are all sorts of mechanisms that the judges are allowed to apply so that people feel comfortable testifying about the crimes that they are are called to substantiate. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I would like to also extend the question to to Ibrahim, how your organization, I mean, I understand it's very important legally to distinguish and to not collapse different charges. How is it socially and how, how is stigmatization in the society, especially when you talk about sexual violence against men, how... Is, is your center working on that specifically, and what are the challenges for for your organization and for others um, doing this type of work? Certainly, um, 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 crimes like rape, um, or yeah, rape, sexual violence, they carry a lot of stigmatization. So again, part of the reason they in the in uh, at the special court the court set up a witness and victims protection services unit was forced to ensure that these women and in Syria yeah we didn't have any um men who we are uh, basically there are no charges relating to sexual violence against men it was exclusively women so and that is really not it, it, an issue in the Sierra Leonean society. But rape, yes, was an issue during the war, and even after the war, it's continued to happen. And of course, it carries huge, huge um, um, stigma just to go out there and say, I was raped. And hardly anyone says it in public in Sierra Leone. So it's, I mean, it's such a sensitive issue. So one of the things um, we have done. Just generally, we have led advocacy efforts to make sure that even in court, victims of rape or other forms of um, sexual violence, that they think the society will use to stigmatize them, they are now, sort of their identity is now protected. So, for example, in Freetown, um, they... Courts hear such cases on Saturdays when there are fewer people around the court building. And even so, if they don't want um, the public to be present, they can hold closed sessions. So that is, I think, an important step forward in ensuring that, indeed, like you are saying, women have an opportunity to just explain, to give a narrative in terms of the um, the crime um, they have suffered. But it's also about just basically educating the public and letting the public and the victims in particular understand that it is not their fault. And our organization undertakes massive public education efforts and we do radio and media outreach, community outreach. So we have um, what uh, people call community monitors. These are people who carry huge respect in their communities. They are role models. We have recruited and trained these people and we are using them to basically work at community level to educate people and of course to encourage victims to come forward to explain to them the violations they have suffered. A bill is currently in the works, because one of the things that I'd like to talk about quickly is that um, 
there is a culture of silence in Sierra Leone, but what is even more threatening to efforts at combating impunity for sexual based crimes is what we call out of court settlement. So some girl gets raped and then um, the police starts investigation, probably charges are preferred. Then the family just turns up overnight and approaches the police and say, you know what? She is our daughter. Get your hands off. We don't want to go to court. This is a family issue and all that. We have moved for a bill which is called the Sexual Offenses Act, which basically criminalizes out-of-court settlements. It means that if a parent or the head of a family or a local chief or whoever it is, including the victim herself, tells the police that she doesn't want to pursue the case anymore, it becomes a crime. Um, she can either pay two million or go to jail for two years. And we are also leading advocacy. Once the bill gets passed, is actually about ensuring that judges are on the high side of custodial sentences, basically sending people to jail rather than asking them to pay money. And at the national level, and I like the point about characterization of crimes and interpreting the law and even the sentencing. We are trying to move for some sentencing guidelines for gender-based crimes because, you know, if you just give somebody a slap, you know, on the wrist, it's going to encourage some more other, um, some other people to commit it. So somebody is accused of, say, domestic violence, for example, um, beats up his wife and um, you impose $100 fine, he's, he'll pay and another person will do it. So we want judges to set, basically come along with us in terms of making sure that they impose custodial sentences in particular for gender and sexual based crimes. But we also understand that it is men who mostly commit these sexual and gender based crimes. Yes, women sometimes too, but it is very few and far in between. So what we are doing basically is to work with men. So we have identified men role models, male role models, who we are using to go out there. Some of them are former perpetrators themselves, but now they have sort of converted, and we're using the converts to go out there and basically talk to their male, um, to their you know um, male colleagues in the community to um, understand that it's a crime. And again, nothing is perfect, but I think the fact that in 2007 we passed three very good gender laws, the Domestic Violence Act, the Registration of Customary Marriage and Divorce Act, and the Devolution of Estate Act. Those three laws, implementation still remains a challenge, of course. But just for our written and advocacy purposes, we have used these laws we have gone to almost every community in the regions that we work, just educating people, using the radio to great effect, to let them understand that it is not business as usual. Times have changed, and we must change with time. So, yes, some small, like I was saying, some small, small progress is taking place, and um, we we'll still need some more work to do, but it is certainly not what it used to be before the war. And I can tell you that because gender specific crimes were pervasive, that was basically what continued during the war. It was, there was no discussion about these issues before the war. It was almost acceptable for a man to beat up his wife. For, I mean, people got raped, women got raped, the justice system wasn't functioning, hardly any conviction was ever reached in those cases. So when the war actually broke out, it was just continuing it at a different scale though. Now the war has ended, and the discussions around these issues are massive. And um, everyone understands that it's a crime. But then people do it because they've been used to doing it, and also because the justice system doesn't, is not perfect. I'm not sure it's perfect anywhere. But ours is quite um, um, a different story altogether. Thank you very much. More questions and comments for this discussion? Yeah, 
erstmal herzlichen Dank nochmal für diese spannenden Einblicke und äh, Einschätzungen auch zum Urteil. Ähm, ich würde gerne nochmal bezogen auf die Situation in Sierra Leone genauer nachfragen, was das Potenzial, also jetzt dieses Urteils bezogen auf, ähm, was es in der äh, Gesellschaft selber ausmacht, so bedeutet. Weil, also gerade wenn ich das richtig verstanden habe, haben Sie gesagt, also 90 Prozent der ähm, Leute in Sierra Leone unterstützen das oder finden das gut. Ähm, aber ich frage mich, also ich meine, es hat ja auch eine, eine breite ähm, Rebellenorganisation gegeben oder eine starke. Äh, und insofern kann ich mir vorstellen, dass das auch sehr widersprüchlich ist, also auch bezogen auf die, die Verbrechen. Da stehen ja auch Familien hinter, also der Täter. So, und wie gehen die denn damit um oder gibt es da auch Formen von Angst oder ähm, gibt es auch, und das ist jetzt nochmal ein Schritt zurück, die Frage nach den äh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission äh, Empfehlungen auch, gibt es andere Formen, die auf Aussöhnung auch zwischen Opfern und Tätern ausgerichtet waren, ähm, ja und wie hängen die vielleicht auch nochmal zusammen oder wie spielen die ineinander? Any other question related to that? Yeah. So, yeah. any other questions or should we tackle this? Yeah. All right. Um, One is a little bit, um, I'm Claudia Trom and I'm intern at the GVE and I will ask in English. <laughs> um, one is more for clarification and goes hand in hand with Kitty's question. So due to the peace accord granting amnesty, are there no jurisdictions? or no national criminal courts dealing with sexual violence against women or men during the civil war and the other one is a little bit off topic but just if you know about it um, women um, or girl child soldiers were afterwards marginalized or even excluded from DDR programs so do you know about local initiatives um, supporting the girls or especially girls who have children and Yeah, it would be great to hear something about that. So maybe you tackle all those questions. How does society come to terms? What is the potential of the Taylor verdict for society to, to deal with it? How is the TRC taken up? What are What is happening to the girl ex-combatants? Um, and what is national jurisdiction doing? So it's... The conglomerate, and maybe you could come in from other experiences that uh, are cases of the International Criminal Court that we hope would uh, draw on the lessons that are now being learned in Sierra Leone. I should have probably told you this from the outset. When Chastillo was arrested and transferred into the custody of the court, I was working for the court at the time. People were partying in Freetown. I could see people jubilating, singing, dancing. And that should tell you what his trial and conviction means for the people of Sierra Leone. He was the, the single most important factor um, that fueled the conflict in Sierra Leone. Clearly, and this is not just my opinion, the, the trial chamber has established that. In other words, without Taylor's support, the war would have ended probably six or seven years before it did. And um, yes, his conviction represents justice. I'm sure most Sierra Leoneans, even those who are not directly affected by the war, relate to it and think that, you know, there was a BBC interview with this man before the war where he said, Sierra Leoneans will one day suffer the bitterness of war. And that is one thing that every Sierra Leonean remembers. And there couldn't be a better way of, I mean, sort of giving Sierra Leoneans a sense of justice um, than 
indicting and convicting just the law. So indeed, it's going to be useful. And we are, I have also made a point about the fact that his verdict is going to be very useful in terms of just reminding politicians or those who think that they are so powerful in society, in the Australian society, of course, that um, they cannot be shielded if they were to order or indeed um, perpetrate um, acts of violence or gender-based violence themselves. So, indeed, um, Sierra Leoneans think that um, just law needed to have his day in court, and they are extremely happy that he did. Um, um, he did. And um, there are many ways this verdict is going to be useful to the Sierra Leonean society, not only in terms of um, communicating justice or basically calling for F, um, for for strengthening accountability mechanisms in Sierra Leone, but it's also, I think, going to help. Like we have said, it's definitely going to contribute to international jurisprudence. So it means a lot for the people of Sierra Leone. I'm no doubt about that. And um, the TRC, um, whether there are any other. Um, forms of reconciliation after the TRC. I talked about the Fambu Talk Initiative, which is actually not led by the Israeli government. It's led by an independent organization. Um, it has not covered the entire country. It has worked mostly in the southern and eastern parts of the country. It still needs to come to the west and go to the, um, the northern part of the country. But at least there has been a follow-up mechanism. Clearly, the TRC um, process was not perfect. It certainly wasn't perfect. And it happened when the special court had been established. At the time that the prosecutor had arrived in the country, had started investigations. So there was suspicion especially from perpetrators, and this is something that I like to underline. The fact that the TRC and the Special Court basically worked about the same time meant that most perpetrators were reluctant to come before the TRC to generally express remorse, to say sorry. So there was a gap in terms of actually getting the perpetrators, who were ultimately not tried by the court, so even just say sorry, which would have meant a lot to the victims. It did not happen because they feared that their apology, their testimony before the TRC could have been used by the court, which is why there was massive need for a follow-up mechanism. Now, um, it, an independent organization is doing that, but I'm not sure whether it is, it is, it is sufficient. Um, so um, I think... Let us also remember that time heals, and this is something that people should always remember. Ten years after the war, um, most people have moved on. But those who we are um, the most affected victims of the war, people who are disabled by the war, who lost their parents, who lost their families, who lost uh, members of the family who are basically the breadwinners, still live with the social and economic impact of the war. And it is those people that uh, who find it very difficult to move on. The war is all, I mean, their disability or disabilities would be a constant reminder to them, um, to them about the war. And those are the people that we really need to um, um, focus on in terms of making sure that the social and economic um, needs, um, their social and economic needs are addressed. So clearly, um, time is healing, but I think those who need support um, should be given that support. And I think the Australian government has a responsibility to take a lead on that. Of course, it can always um, ask for support from the international community, but we believe that the Israeli government must take the lead on that, and I'm not sure whether it has distinguished itself in that respect. Um, the, yes, the peace accord gave amnesty to um, um, all the fighters. Remember before, um, this was in, in 1996, and then um, there was another accord, actually, after that, which finally brought the war to an end. The argument has been made that, and this was even why the special accord um, um, inducted all those real unions, that crimes, international crimes, um, amnesty does not apply to international crimes. And we, we think that, I personally believe that, 
those mid-level commanders who we are very influential, who we are very active, should also be brought to justice. And certainly in terms of residual mechanism of the special court, my understanding is that the prosecutor of the court should have provided some evidence to the Sierra Leonean government in terms of the, I mean, those other commanders whom the court couldn't try for obvious reasons to the Australian government, and the Australian government should look into the possibility of bringing them to justice. But let's also remember that and the, uh, there is a relationship between politics and justice. You've got to be bold. You've got to um, basically, it's, it's basically a political suicide to start going after commanders who clearly are in their hundreds, in their thousands, and people are going to politicize it. And our leaders take their politics very seriously. They, like, they take power very seriously. So I think the political ramifications, in my opinion, are the stumbling block to you know, bringing these mid-level commanders to justice other than any amnesty and, uh, and, uh, um, that um, may have been granted or that was indeed granted to these um, f- um, fighters. So... It, it clearly, um, Claudia, um, there is no national mechanism um, that is bringing to justice those mid-level commanders in Sierra Leone. At the moment, um, there is clearly no discussion about that. At the moment, clearly the Sierra Leone government has not indicated its um, willingness um, to do it. So it's something that I think um, we'll leave for later, certainly not now. Um, yes, the, the, the DR, the disarmament, um, demobilization, and um, reintegration was not perfect, but I think in the end we got what we wanted. People are disarmed, they were um, demobilized. But the most, I think the challenging aspect of the process was the reintegration process. Indeed, um, what they did was they provided skills training to um, ex combatants. But we even basically ridiculed the skills that they received. So they were given six months training, and if somebody wasn't very wasn't a good driver, people would say, "Oh, you are a DDR trained driver." So it was basically about demeaning even the skills that these people received, and about um, um, the girl ex combatants. Indeed, I'm not sure there was um, a deliberate strategy to capture them and to address their needs, probably even cancel them and make sure that they were reintegrated into the society and continue to um, be useful to the society generally. So that is why, unfortunately, most of them ended up being with uh, some, um, basically not doing anything useful to commit. Some of them became commercial sex workers. Some of them basically... um, Yes, they were not captured. Even the the male ex-combatants, um, yes, they ended up, ended up becoming what um, taxi commercial bike riders in Sierra Leone. We call them Okada. Yes, so uh, that process did a bad job of basically um, churning out maybe thousands of young men and women with. Uh, without basically properly integrate, reintegrating them into the society. And remember, th- some of them were orphans as well. Some of them were victims of rape, of sexual violence, and they were never actually captured. So, And they have continued to live with it. And, and again, some of them did not even register for the repressions program because either because they didn't have any family members that would take them, bring them forward. They just felt that... Um, there was no hope for them. So serious social issues um, exist in, in, in Sierra Leone. But again, we needed this trial. We needed a special court. And we needed a law in the dock. And I've often said it was not about his conviction. It was just about the fact that he had his day in court. And remember, like I said, the fact that he was even arrested and transferred into the custody of the court was what most people actually wanted. They didn't, get, they didn't have a chance to follow the proceedings. But they definitely knew that some action had been taken. And that was very, very critical. And from that day, most of them just moved on. So everything that happened in the courtroom, yes, was sometimes interesting, boring. 
But for them, they had received justice from the day to laws in that And that was why there was massive jubilation. And I can tell you that the reaction, and this is basically based on the reaction that I saw at the time he was arrested and the one that I saw uh, um, after the verdict. It wasn't like partying or dancing after the verdict, but it was after he was arrested and transferred. Partly because hardly anyone believed that a head of state or former head of state could be arrested and brought before, you know, a court in my country. And it is also cultural. <laughs> if you become a minister, uh, you be, are basically immune, like nothing happens. So a, a minister is basically someone who is immune. I mean, I can't speak about the president. So this had serious impact on the Syrian linear psyche. So indeed, it's been very, very useful. It's been very, very helpful. And this is something that we're going to use again for advocacy and practical purposes. Thank you very much. I think it's, it's very important also to look at that fact, what happens to the other perpetrators much below. Amnesty is in a way necessary to get to peace accords, to, to get society to a healing I think there might be discussion on how how much time really heals and what uh, is really still, you know, if you look at some of the European processes or some of the Central American processes that are now taken up after 20, 30, 60 years, um, there's also different experiences to that, and I think it's, it's absolutely important. Do you have a... a at, at uh, the Women's Coalition, do you have at the Women's Initiative like a, a policy on that? I mean, how much, how many things have to be tried and where would you see is, is sort of the break between this is, yeah. this is part of jurisdiction and this is something that's part of other necessary processes and probably very challenging processes? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we don't have a, a policy for ourselves, but we certainly dealt with it together with our partners, uh, specifically in the Uganda situation. Um, where there is an amnesty act um, that is uh, still in force, that was um, partially it, it, it's it's diminishing in its in its um, in its power, but it was supposed to expire in May, and parts of it still exist. With our partners from the Greater North, the position on that um, Amnesty Act was that it should conclude when the, the Juba peace process concluded and that it may have a role in coming to the peace process but that it should not exist beyond that. Now, five years later, uh, the Amnesty Act is still... Um, it is actually uh, created legal confusion and litigation around the first domestic trial of a Lord's Resistance Army commander so that the trial has stopped while the Constitutional Court considers his claim to amnesty. So it's working its way through the legal process. So that's an interesting example um, of how this can play out. Um, I think from the perspective of uh, the women that we work with, uh, what, what I have heard from our Ugandan partners is that they do see a role for amnesties as one of the tools that can, uh, in a very limited way, be used towards arriving at you know a, a certain point in a, in a peace negotiation or it's, it's appropriate for certain types of crimes, for certain classes of perpetrators. For serious crimes and gender crimes, I think the ruling of the Special Court for Sierra Leone is an important one, and it's the one that should be followed internationally. But I, I think we all acknowledge the complexity of, of coming through a peace process and that traditionally amnesty has been one of the tools that has enabled certain uh, agreements or certain portions of agreements. Um, to... Just speak very briefly about the, the position of girl soldiers. This, of course, being the first, um, the, the, the only charges um, in the first uh, trial judgment from the International Criminal Court. Um, the, one of the things that was significant about that trial was the acknowledgement, actually, from the special representative on children in armed conflict, Radhika Kumaraswamy, who was called as an expert witness in that case, that that's exactly what happens, that girls are left out of the DDRR process um, often, and that in, in it is important that 
extra attention and care is taken to fully describe what it means to be a child soldier for both a boy and a girl. Um, the testimony in the trial bears it out that there are significant um, aspects uh, that girls experience uh, rape and sexual violence as part of the enlistment and conscription process. Um, boys are forced to commit or to enable um, rape and sexual and, and, and other forms of sexual violence um, as part of the enlistment and conscription process and also while they are serving with the armed group. So, um, you know, again, we're looking for the meaning in these decisions and for the meaning of these judgments. What is the significance of them? Um, it is highly significant, I think, that we now have these long, legal, considered international documents that detail these experiences and that talk about how we situate them in terms of law. And it can be dry and it can seem irrelevant, and I agree there is so much work to be done to make it relevant. Um, but the fact remains that these are now part of the historical record for all of their flaws, <laughs> and, and you know that we, we may disagree with how cases have gone, but it's, it is highly significant that they exist and that these experiences are described often in the own words of the victim survivor and then endorsed by the judges. And I think that's very, very important, that, that acknowledgement that these experiences and these crimes happened is very important, and it's one of the things that we hear about. Why bother with the International Criminal Court? Why bother risking my life and my family and, and my security to testify at an institution like this? It's because the international acknowledgement of crimes that are often invisibilized, especially gender-based crimes, is so significant. So that's, that's you know, I think one of the milestones of, of the Taylor judgment, and in a more subtle way, one of the things we can take from the International Criminal Court's first judgment, even if it's not as full as we would like it to be in terms of its treatment of gender-based crimes. This sounds almost as a closing remark. It is historic, but still we have way to go. But I don't want to close un unless if there's other questions and other, other comments. Juliana. Uh, yeah, Juliane Westphal. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was just, just wondering if that is really sort of the impact of the Taylor verdict. Definitely, okay, you have a lot of testimonies now. But what I found really uh, amazing in Sierra Leone was that uh, although ra sort of women have been very stigmatized by rape, a lot of women came out and talked about the rape. And although the court and the TRC tried to protect them, they still went and did interviews in the radio programs and some insisted to talk publicly in the TRC. And I think the mere fact that it was publicly acknowledged as a crime, that was the bigger step. And the same actually happened in Liberia again. I was working for the TRC and everybody was saying, no, no, you know, women have to uh, testify secretly and definitely we should forbid that they testify publicly. But some women really insisted on testifying publicly. That was probably not the majority, but I think that's due to the fact that of the acknowledgement this is a, a war crime. Yeah. Uh, and I had another comment for Ibrahim, actually. Yes. Because you were saying uh, you're hoping that the com sort of mid-level command would still g uh, be tried in national courts. And I can understand sort of, yeah, why that, or, you know, I can understand why that is important for some people. At the same time, it would have probably a very bad impact on future truth commissions because... Uh, people would not sort of trust a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and go there and testify if maybe three years later mid-level commanders will be tried. Yes, it's... Okay. It, yes, it, it's, it's certainly um, a kind of cash-22 situation, right? It's 
it's a quagmire. Everyone understands that um, if if um, you you can really betray people's trust, even if they are perpetrators. I I understand the need to uh, remain faithful to the promises to make. Anthony Kasasi, when he's so rest in peace, um, did a report on the special court. He went to, I think it was in 2008 or so, he basically reviewed the court and made a number of recommendations, both recommendations. And he was an experienced lawyer and had worked in international criminal justice for many years. His view was that the amnesty and indeed the TRC um, process should be no bar to prosecuting those mid-level commanders. That is very clear in the Kassasi report. Because rape is both a common law and a statutory offense in Sierra Leone. So just, um, you leave the special court statute aside, just the Sierra Leone government can use its own laws. And that is why you, you made mention about as a hybrid court should have used both Sierra Leone and international law. So my point is that, yes, I understand the need to, I mean, the restorative aspect of um, um, justice or criminal justice is very, very important. To the extent that really people get a sense of justice. But in Sierra Leone, I mean, I'm, I'm going to contextualize this. It's basically based on what I know about Sierra Leone and what is happening in Sierra Leone with respect to the TRC process. I think the TRC was, I mean, did a great job of putting together a very good report. It's about one of the best TRC reports you can come across. It's a very good, solid report. But I'm not sure that report that report is sort of reflective or representative of the process itself. So I'm not suggesting that people sat in the room and put together a report, but the report is by far better than the actual process. Which, what am I suggesting? The point I'm making is that the process was not perfect. It was no way near being perfect, which is why I'm not sure that people... If, I have, if they have ever moved on, whether they moved on because of the TRC process, and you're really talking about justice, you're actually talking about people moving on, people coming to terms with the past, people um, understanding that what happened was for the crimes that I suffered. So if we can have very good, I mean, a, a reconciliation process or a restorative mechanism that basically addresses the justice needs of the victims, I'm fine. But the gaps that we are in the terrorist process, in my opinion, um, we are such that um, we definitely need a follow-up mechanism. It could be like an international criminal, um, a special court like the one we had, or some other process that will bring true justice and a, <clears throat> a, a, a sense of closure. It's actually about closure. You know, um, I can tell you that the terrorist process did not bring closure. So that is why we had a follow-up mechanism. And it was amazing. The number of people just came forward um, to talk um, at these family talk sessions, you know. So which means that, um, in my opinion, um, something ought to have been done. Yes, women came out to talk. Remember, in the Tiller verdict, to get back to the Tiller verdict, the judge, the trial chamber, said that women were publicly raped. I mean, raped in the full view of the public. This was not like one woman that was randomly raped in the full view of the, uh, in the full view of the public. It was a pattern. It was basically a weapon of war. Again, rightly, the Try to my head that it was basically an act to terrorize the civilian population. So if you saw a woman being publicly raped, you would know that it was time for you to flee, to run away. So those women who came forward to talk about it, we are those who knew that probably everyone knew in their society. But generally, even they thought that 
this woman was raped during the war, during the war, through no fault of hers. Basically, um, it brings a lot of stigma on the person, the family, and it's not something that... So that is why most victims, as you know, testified as protector witnesses. And the court was very serious about that. And their protection was always... Um, sort of um, guarded. So, um, which is not to say indeed there were no women who didn't want to testify publicly. And, um, um, yes, it was obviously uh, very helpful in terms of the public just acknowledging that rape occurred because it happened in their presence. In new. So, again, the question about how is it that it was successful, how is it that the court, the special court was able to get witnesses, to get victims, Victim survivors, because even the community people knew who the victims were, so it was really easy to know who the victims were. Because these acts occurred in some cases in the full view of the public, and there were medical organizations that had victims of rape. There were other organizations that have chronicled, I mean, sort of accounts of victims. So it was basically public knowledge that rape occurred and there are the victims and they know who the victims were. But I think this, again, just talking about the special court process generally and the tale of it in particular, what it has done is that the discussion on just gender issues, on gender crimes, on gender and sexual-based crimes has increased incrementally, incrementally it is now a disco- it's there are about at least 50 women's organizations in Sierra Leone at various levels and they are all speaking in the same language that it is time to end the discrimination that women suffer it is time to end the sexual and gender based violence every um, um, gender based organization is working on that i can tell you that before the war there were almost none and that is something and you know, the war was certainly bad, but out of that means that we have, there's a potential that in 10, 15, 20 years, we could have a society that is free of the very obvious, blatant crimes that were committed against women and for which women never um, got justice. It may not be the case in 15 years, in 10 years, in 20 years. It is certainly not the case now as it was 10 years ago or even before the war. So I think we are making some progress. I mean, yes, it is slow, but I'm sure we'll get there someday. Thank you. Rita, you had another question. Rita Schäfer. Uh, wir sind ja hier in den Räumen... Um, wir sind hier in den Räumen einer politischen Stiftung und ähm, ich möchte noch mal nach Ihren Erwartungen und Einschätzungen zur ähm, deutschen ähm, Regierungspolitik äh, zu den hier diskutierten Fragen hören und vor allen Dingen hinsichtlich Ihrer Erwartungen. Ähm, denn kürzlich kam durch die Medien die Information, dass die deutsche Regierung die Unterstützung für den ICE, ICC äh, reduzieren wird, will. Ähm, was sind Ihre Erwartungen diesbezüglich? Und ähm, zu Ihnen in Sierra Leone, ähm, was sind Ihre Erwartungen, gerade vor dem hier skizzierten Hintergrund der Genderpolitik, ähm, der zivilen Konfliktbearbeitung und der Menschenrechte, was ja alles drei große Ziele der deutschen Regierung sind? Vielen Dank. Und ich würde gerne noch die Frage vielleicht anschließen. I would like to add the question, What do you expect from German government, but also recommendations maybe to other civil society organizations, international actors, and so on? So maybe we can combine this to come out with some recommendations, building on the factors you've mentioned and building on the challenges that are still ahead. Um, well, I'm actually very interested to hear that it's reached the media that, that the German government is co considering um, or has, has decided to reduce their funding to the ICC. This is an enormous issue uh, across all of the funders for the court right now. Um, the International Criminal Court, because it is a treaty-based court, depends on the state's parties to the treaty to fund its activities. So the entire budget comes from the states who are, are signatories to this treaty. And the uh, 
burden of the funding falls, of course, more on the, uh, the, the richer countries. So Japan, I think, is the top funder. Germany is certainly in the top ten, if not number two. Uh, the UK is a, a big funder. Australia, Canada. Um, so it is um, – what the ICC has been facing in the last couple of years is uh, a push on the parts of states for a zero-growth policy on the budget – at a time when the court's work is actually expanding. And what states' parties to the statute have been looking for are areas of the court's work that can be cut while still maintaining the justice mandate of the court. It's a very difficult thing to do because one of the... um, the, um, Among the reasons the ICC is such an important institution is because it... Uh, has within its um, structure things like the participation of victims in the legal process and the provision of lawyers for victims who cannot pay for them, a trust fund for victims that can not only fund a reparations order after a conviction but also has an assistance mandate to help victims of crimes through various projects before or regardless of any conviction. Um, it has a very uh, reasonable uh, legal aid program to pay for a fair defense, which without a fair defense, you do not have a fair trial and a, and a fair verdict. Um, so to, to pay for defense counsel. It has a very important outreach program, having taken a lesson learned from the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, particularly the Yugoslavia tribunal, which was so far away, Uh, relative to to where the crimes took place and taking a lesson from the special court uh, for Sierra Leone about how important it is to devote resources to informing the affected communities about these trials and these judicial proceedings and what their rights are and what is happening. So all of these features are contained within the court and they are all considered uh, integral to the ICC as an institution. Um, What is happening with the current budget cuts, and we actually don't know, so the the International Criminal Court, I think, is just starting to work under its more reduced budget. Um, Legal aid is one of the areas that is probably going to suffer the most. I think also um, outreach is contested, so the amount of funds that will go towards outreach. Um, And... uh, Other areas, I mean, in the past, the prosecution has wanted to reduce the number of investigators they have um, in the field and have them sort of switch in and out of different situations and investigations, which makes their job very difficult because, of course, you need to know the context and make relationships and get engaged and and stay there um, to, you know, have a, a field presence in order to get the testimonies you need to substantiate the charges. So... It is very difficult for the court. Um, we, I, I think from, from our discussions with states' parties and their representatives in The Hague, and we do a lot of advocacy with states' parties, they're in a difficult position, and they certainly, I think, understand the uniqueness of the institution and its mandate. Um, I don't think that necessarily the understanding of the legal advisors or people who work closely on these issues trickles all the way through the government so that there's full support for this institution. I think it's also eroded a little bit by um, the selectivity of the prosecutions and the, the, the charges that we discussed earlier, that it's a court only prosecuting Africans and that there are no, you know, that, that it, it, it's not um, really a world institution yet. Um, so to the German government, I think that the, our advocacy is around really supporting the features of this court that make it unique and that will make it a meaningful mechanism for justice. So not cutting those things that seem like extras to the justice process, but really understanding that these were part of the Rome Statute because of lessons learned from other international justice mechanisms that did not, and specifically courts, that were not fully able to address all of the things that they needed to address. 
So integrating victim survivors into the legal process and, and outreach and legal aid and all of those things. Um, in terms of uh, civil society, I mean, I think, again, the push for... Um, Universality. So globally, civil society joins together to call for implementing or er, er, signing, and the the Rome Statute of you know all of the countries who haven't signed it yet. Um, also, the obligations. So if your country is a signatory of the Rome Statute, there is an obligation to implement the law of the Rome Statute into your domestic legislation, and that includes the gender provisions. And it is um, done with varying degrees of success. It can be monitored. It can be um, – you can get involved in the legislative process. There are a number of international groups that work closely on that. I think that's very important for civil society in a conflict situation um, or a post-conflict situation. You can certainly advocate for an investigation into that situation by the International Criminal Court should crimes within the jurisdiction of the court having been committed. Um, and I think also to, to really understand that, that you know, we've, we've covered a lot, I think, with the, the truth commissions and, and the, the sort of very deep impact of conflict that is only partially addressed by a judicial mechanism and a judicial response. So understanding that this connects with our work, general work on impunity, with our work on domestic crimes within the, the domestic jurisdiction of the domestic court, so not international crimes, but regular domestic violence and gender-based crimes that are committed on a, a not widespread and systematic scale, um, you know, to, to make those connections and by supporting the work of the court, I think civil society is really increasing uh, the ability to have a dialogue about this exactly as you were saying, and it's informing all of our advocacy, and I think that's extremely important. Thank you very much. I would like to give you the final word before I think we come and have all a drink instead of us just drinking a bit on the, on the podium. Um, what is your recommendation to the Germans and also to fellow Sierra Leoneans, to other countries, to civil society? My recommendation to the German government will be twofold. First, to scale up and not to reduce its support um, for international criminal justice, particularly the ICC. It is absolutely critical. I think 10 years after the court was established, um, we cannot afford to um, sort of leave it in the lodge, if you like. If we don't sort of scale up our support or even maintain the current level of support, it's going to fail. And it would be a shame if this court, this court failed because of financial problems. And it will fail if it doesn't um, get the um, um, adequate um, financial um, resources um, that it needs. Um, that would be my first recommendation. The second one would be, even at the national level, here in Germany, I think um, the German government needs to do so much to make sure that um, gender-based violence is addressed, it's addressed. And I think, talking about civil society, this is not only about the government, it's also about the ordinary German, ordinary German understanding that he or she has a responsibility to act and to sort of protect each other. Because um, if, if again, I've had some discussions since I arrived in this country 40 hours ago, and some of the stuff I have had is just um, it's kind of shocking. So I believe that we have to, at home, um, while indeed increasing support for international criminal justice. I think at home we have to do a bit more. Now, civil society back in Sierra Leone, I think um, the room statute, we need to have an implementing legislation. So, you know, the ICC works on a complementarity principle, which means that if the Sierra Leone government has the capacity, has the willingness to prosecute crimes of international nature, the ICC does not necessarily have to send investigators to Sierra Leone. But that can only happen if the room study is um, what we say domesticated. There is an implementing legislation. We do not have that at the moment, and we uh, we have organized a number of events. Uh, we have made um, some contacts. We had hoped that we will get it before the elections in November. I'm not sure, but I think back in Sierra Leone, 
the room start, um, it's something we need to have an implementing legislation. I think um, civil society in Sierra Leone um, needs to understand that, um, you know, like the philosophy of our community monitors program, we think that everyone should support each other. So your neighbors, this is cultural. I'm not sure it's going to happen in Germany, but I believe that your neighbor's problem should be your problem. And as I've often made the argument, these crimes happen within the community before the police comes in, before it goes to the court. And if at the community level we are showing some willingness to at least in the first place address it at that level to make sure that we prevent it. And if it does happen, make sure that we give the um, victims the support they require. I think it's going to be very, very helpful. Of course, civil society should continue working on um, issues that um, will strengthen our law enforcement agencies, strengthen our national accountability systems, the court. In Sierra Leone, we are the only organization that consistently monitors the justice institutions. Like, we are the only organization that sends monitors every weekday at various courts across the country. Well, not in all the regions, but at least in three regions of the four regions of the country. I think we need to pay a lot more attention to the justice um, sector because at the end of the day, it's actually about, we cannot, again, this is, this is a point, I, I believe that we cannot, you know, prevent, necessarily prevent it, I mean, realistically, because you can't really, it's a sociological thing, you cannot necessarily stop someone from doing the wrong thing. But if the law works, I'm sure the law is going to, the deterrence aspect of it is what I think the law does. So like the Taylor verdict, again, in concluding, it is going to basically serve as some deterrence. It's going to be a constant reminder, at least to those who are sane, to those who are in power, to those who had been taught that international criminal justice, they uh, would, I'm sort of, they would enjoy head of state impunity or they are so powerful that they would never be brought to justice. The, it was a myth and the tale of um, trial and conviction has just um, um, shown what a myth it was. And I'm sure um, what we can do as citizens of the world is to make sure that we constantly contribute to efforts at combating impunity at national and global level. Every victim deserves a conf- a, a, every victim deserves justice, and every perpetrator must have his day in court. Once again, thank you very much to the um, 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 Heinrich Ball Foundation, particularly the Gonda um, um, Vona Institute. I think you guys put in a lot of effort. Um, Particular thanks to Marika, Christiana, and Dick Gitti. I think um, without their support, I would have never made it to um, Germany in the first place. It was just annoying that I had to do a number of things. But in the end, I'm extremely pleased to have participated in this. And I think it's useful to myself. And I hope we have all enjoyed it. Feel free. Um, the Institute has my contact details. If there are any issues that you'd like to clear up with me after this session, feel free to send me an email, and I'll be happy to respond. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Well, thank you to Ibrahim and to Kate for helping us understand why it is a milestone. Well, we started with the proposition it is a milestone that Taylor has been convicted of sexual violence. We saw the challenges, but we also saw some factors and some lessons that can be shared and learned and hopefully build upon. And I understand there's drinks outside to continue the discussion, and thanks for those who stayed inside, and even though it was a bit warm and a heated discussion took place, I think we, we now deserve a drink. Thanks for staying with us, and thanks to both of you again for the excellent work your organizations do and for sharing your insights with us. Yes, thanks very much also to uh, the translator because they always have to do a hard job. So, and once more, thank you for, to you and uh, also to Marike because she was really preparing uh, this discussion. Thank you. Where is she now? <laughs> okay. There you are. Okay. <laughs>